In the SIP overview module, we mentioned that in the OSI networking model, SIP is an application layer protocol, but reuses the network layer's IP addressing. This leads to two main problems when one or more private networks separate two SIP devices trying to communicate with each other. In this module, we'll look at these problems in more depth and discuss how Aster's configuration options can help address them. The first problem, related to SIP and NAT, occurs when a SIP device is behind a NAT and tries to register with Asterisk. As a simple example, let's assume that a user on an Asterisk system is a traveling salesman, and they frequently register to Asterisk using a soft phone client from various private networks around the world. Here they are connecting to a hotel network. Their phone is provided a private internal IP address of 192.168.1.20. The NAT router has interfaces on both the internal private network and the public internet. When the phone sends a SIP register message to Asterisk, the message is carried in an IP packet. The IP packet passes through the router that translates the packet's internal private IP address into a public IP address. But the SIP message is unchanged and still contains the private IP address. Asterisk receives the register request and responds to it promptly using the originating public IP address in the packet. But the registration record that Asterisk keeps for the device is the private IP address from the SIP message. So when Asterisk tries to send a call to the register phone, it looks up its IP address and finds an unroutable private address. When this happens, the call will fail. As we mentioned, in the SIP overview module, there are solutions outside Asterisk that attempt to address the same problem. It's worth checking the settings on your firewall device to see if it's capable of stateful packet inspection or is considered SIP aware. If so, you may be able to solve the problem without modifying Asterisk. But Asterisk has its own solution to the problem. We can configure the SIP peer in Asterisk with the option NAT equals yes. When set, Asterisk will ignore the address in the SIP headers and instead will store the address that it finds in the IP header which will always be an address that Asterisk can route. When Asterisk routes a call to that IP address, the hotel's router should properly forward the message to the SIP phone. Most SIP-aware network devices use this exact same approach to prevent this problem. It is not recommended to set NAT equals yes in SIP.conf if you also have a network device configured to do the same thing. This redundancy helps nothing and may present other issues. Most firewalls follow the same basic principles. Block most outside traffic from getting in, allow most inside traffic to get out, and allow traffic from the outside that is a direct response to something sent from inside. The second problem with SIP and NAT occurs when a firewall is not sophisticated enough to know when certain outside traffic should be allowed in. Remember that earlier in the chapter we said that audio or other media in a VoIP call is carried by RTP and that the RTP ports used are negotiated in SDP messages. Most firewalls are easily configured to let external SIP traffic enter the internal network, so call setup usually works just fine. But part of call setup involves negotiating the RTP ports to use, and most firewalls are not aware of this. So they regard an incoming stream of RTP media as something that should be kept out, because they can't associate it with the SIP messages, and don't realize that it should be let in. Unfortunately, there's not a perfect solution to this problem. Asterisk can't really do anything about it because the problem is a result of SIP architecture and basic firewall design. However, there are a few approaches that can get around the problem. The best solution is to invest in a session border controller, or SIP-aware firewall, which will remove this problem in almost all cases. You can also consider using a STUN server, which is a public server that helps a host behind a NAT figure out its own apparent public IP address so it can tell the peer how to reach it. Another alternative is to have the phone and asterisk on the same VPN so that there is no NAT between them. Finally, you can consider configuring your firewall so that there is a wide range of open ports for RTP to use. But of course, this approach is very insecure. One additional concern related to SIP and NAT involves direct media. The SIP protocol and the phones that implement it are smart enough to send media directly to each other. There's no strict requirement for a system like Asterisk to handle the media between two SIP endpoints because it's a peer-to-peer -peer protocol. Asterisk supports a feature that allows two SIP phones to send media directly to each other and bypass Asterisk after the calls have been set up. Of course, several conditions need to be met for this to work. Asterisk has to forego the ability to record or transmit audio to either phone. 
The phones have to share a compatible codec, and the phones need to be able to route RTP to each other. Asterisk will try to re-invite phones to send media directly to each other by default. Here we see a NAT router has been added. Asterisk is able to route SIP and RTP to phone 2 because we have enabled NAT equals yes in SIP.conf. However, by default, Asterisk will re-invite the media to flow directly between the two endpoints. This can cause problems because of the NAT router. In this illustration, Phone 2 is able to send media to Phone 1 because Phone 1 has a public IP. But Phone 1 is not able to send media to Phone 2 because it cannot route to a private IP. The result is one-way audio. The default behavior can be modified by using the Direct Media option in SIP.conf. Setting direct media equals no will prevent asterisk from trying to re-invite the endpoints to send media directly by keeping the media stream flowing through asterisk. If you experience one-way audio on a SIP call, setting direct media to no is something worth trying. Anytime asterisk or any endpoints are behind a firewall, it's a good idea to enable qualify equals yes, which will send frequent SIP options messages to the endpoint to confirm the status of the device and determine if it is available. This has the added benefit of keeping a port open on the firewall. NAT is a great networking tool, but introduces significant complexity in SIP calling. In this module, we've briefly touched on the asterisk configuration options related to NAT. Therefore, we encourage you to read the section called NAT Support in asterisk's sample SIP.conf file to learn more about the various options available. This concludes our introduction to SIP. In this chapter, we have learned the history and basics of the SIP protocol looked at a typical SIP call flow, learned how to configure and debug SIP in Asterisk, and covered the problems with SIP and NAT. We'll move on now to the next chapter, where we will take a deeper look at EECS, the Inner Asterisk Exchange Protocol.